Good afternoon. Today we are on lab 10 and we're going to be talking about t-tests. My favorite story about t-tests is that William Seeley Gossett uh, published this under the pseudonym student. If we were to look at the original paper, here it is, we'd see that it is by student. It's titled The Probable Error of a Mean. And student was working at Guinness breweries at the time and so the work he was doing would have been um, proprietary and he chose to put it out there in the world anyways and that's why he wrote under a pseudonym so sometimes the t-test is called the student's t-test we're going to jump right in start by talking about a practical guide to the t-test do a conceptual section looking at simulating the t-test and then we're going to do an example of doing simulated power curves uh, with the t-test before moving on to the generalization assignment so r comes with a t-test function not surprisingly let's take a look at it right here here it is and this one function t dot test it will do a one sample paired sample and independent sample t-test there's a bunch of little details that we're going to go over and uh, these uh, will involve looking at changing the test from a two-sided to one-sided we'll use the mu input when we have a one sample test and if we're going to do a paired sample we can set this to true or false and finally uh, there's an option here var dot equal this is for the assumption of equal variances by default, it's set to false, which is a good practical default. Um, as we'll see when we set this default to false, the independent t-test that's conducted will do a correction and it won't produce the uh, standard, quote, standard t-test result. So if you want that result, you'll have to set this to true. Okay, so let's move on. Here's an example of doing a one sample t-test. First of all, we need some numbers. So I just made some random means. Let's take a look at those. Here they are. There's 10 numbers. And uh, for these numbers, I just generated them from the R norm function. I sampled 10 numbers from this normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation one. These could be means for 10 different subjects. Now, in a one sample t-test, I might want to compare the sample mean, which would be the mean of all of these, to some hypothetical population mean. For example, I could enter mu equals zero, and I would be comparing the mean of these samples, which is, let's compute it to figure out what it actually is, negative 0.49 and I'm comparing that to a population mean of zero. So to run the one sample t-test, uh, anytime you have a variable or a vector that's just a bunch of numbers, so a, a single vector, this I guess formula should be x equals, the t-test will be computed as a one sample t-test and you'll get these results. So we get a t value. There's, uh, we'll return the degrees of freedom for you. As well, we have the probability of getting a t value this extreme on a t distribution with nine degrees of freedom. Uh, additionally, there's some 95% confidence intervals returned, and it's going to output the mean of your sample for you. We'll see in a moment the t test function also returns all of this information in the f in a list form and not simply printing it out. So you can access each of these values that way. Moving on, here's how you do a paired sample t-test. For this t-test, you need two vectors. For example, a vector of means in condition A and a vector of means in condition B. I've just generated those randomly here. So A means is 10 hypothetical means from subjects and b means could be 10 different 
hypothetical means, in this case, uh, from the same subjects. And what we're interested in is whether there's a difference between the A means and the B means. So really we're interested in something like, is the mean of the A means, negative 0.56, different from the mean of the B means? And that difference looks like it's um, about 0.68 of a total difference. If we simply insert the vector for the first set of means and the vector for the second set of means, and we set paired equals true, we will conduct a paired sample t-test. And again, we get the t-value, the degrees of freedom, the associated p-value, as well it will print out the, the difference between the mean in the first vector and the mean in the second vector for you. So there's a paired sample t-test. Finally, we have the independent sample t-test. Here we would uh, normally use this when we had different participants in each of our groups. So again, we'd have means for say one group and means for another group. And we wanna know if there's a difference between our sample means. Generally, we'd expect, uh, let's say we have an experiment and we did a manipulation and we we expected that the manipulation would cause a difference in the means. So maybe the A group didn't get the manipulation and the B group did. We want to uh, compare the means to see if there was a difference. And we'd like that difference to be uh, larger than what might be expected based on random sampling alone. And so we could do this independent sample t-test now we have to set var equals to true, and there we have it. If we set var equals to false, we'll get um, a correction. And so just be aware of that. There's another syntax that will be accepted in terms of running the t-test function in R, and this is called the formula syntax. So up for these last three examples, I've simply inserted either a single vector for the one sample or two vectors, each with the means uh, for one group and another or one condition and another. Let's say you had your data represented as a data frame like this. So in this data frame, uh, we have long data and we're saying that these 10 means here are for group A and these 10 are for group B. I could split this up, just grab these uh, 10 values here and put them in the first part of the t-test function and then grab these 10 for B and put them in the other part of the t-test function. Or we could use the formula notation right here. And in this case, um, we take our dependent variable. So this is the name means the name of the column containing the dependent variable and we use the tilde and then the name of the column with the independent variable so that one's group um, to spell that out we're basically saying means as a function of group set var equal to true and there's a data parameter where we point the t-test function at the data frame containing this data. And this will do the, the same exact thing. Next up, we have the ability to change whether the p-value is reported as a one or two-sided test. So for example, on a one sample t-test here, we could, the default is, is going to be a two-sided test. So this is the probability of getting a T value as extreme as this in either direction. And if we wanted to do a one-tailed test, we could specify the direction as less or greater. And uh, all you have to do is write in the alternative input and specify which one you want. By default, alternative is set to two-sided. So if you don't specify alternative, as we've done up here, it's not specified, it will automatically do a two-sided test. We already just discussed the var.equal input 
if you do an independent samples t-test, so this is another way to talk about some defaults here. I've created two vectors. Each vector has example means from 10 subjects. And here's a really simple thing you could do is put in vector one and vector two, and then you can just run the t-test function. So by default here, um, this will be treated as an independent sample t-test. It will also be treated as a Welch two sample t-test, which involves a correction. And in this case, it does not, uh, I believe it does not assume that the variances are equal. In our example data, because we uh, simulated this using uh, taking numbers from the same normal distribution, we can assume that the variances are equal. So we would add in var dot equals true. So by default, if you don't specify var dot equal, the default will be false and it will run the Welch two sample t-test. By setting it to true, you will run the quote standard in, uh, independent sample t-test. Now let's look at the contents of the t-test. So up to this point, every time we ran a t-test, I had the results print to the console. And that is something that occurs when you run the t-test function. At the same time, the t-test function outputs its contents in the form of a list. So let's uh, do this here. I'm going to run this line. And at this point, what's happened is the results of the t-test function have been placed into the my results variable. And we can see that over here. And the my results variable is a list of 10 items and it has a bunch of information in it. Okay. As we learned last lab, if you want to return output um, from one of these functions to the console, that is print the t-test as well as save the contents to a variable, you can do this nifty notation. So I'm just surrounding the whole thing in parentheses. And when I run this line now, I will both save the contents of this function in the my results variable, but it will also print the results to the console. That can be helpful. Once we have our variable, we can inspect it. And it's helpful in our studio that when you start writing out the name of the variable and press dollar sign, it will show you all of the things that are contained in it. So I've just taken the liberty of doing these four. The statistic is the T value that's returned. The parameter is the degrees of freedom. The P value is the probability associated with that T value for that distribution that is a T distribution with this particular degrees of freedom. And estimate is the item that will contain the means of your samples. So that is, uh, these, these can be helpful for reporting your values when you write them up. I'd also like to point out that the Papa Jaw package that we've been using and discussed for writing APA papers has some helpful functions for uh, reporting results. So I've loaded the Papa Jaw function here and the APA print function, if you input uh, variables that contain model output, so in this case we have a t-test model and its output is in my results. The APA print function will receive uh, various models, so we'll learn that the ANOVA will work and a few other ones work here, and let's see what happens. Uh, so in this case, the APA print function will kind of figure out and give you a bunch of options for printing directly to a manuscript. Uh, for example, r this stuff right here, T18 equals negative 2.69, P equals 0 0.015. That could be inserted in a manuscript and, and at the point when you're writing a, the results of a t-test. Now, as an example, in this manuscript or in this lab, I've um, inserted this R code snippet and I've used the APA print function to print the dollar sign statistic uh, 
part, which is this one right here. And if we were to flip over to the website, we can see that in that location, what's happened is this piece has been printed to the manuscript. And so this can be a convenient way to print results of t-tests. Next up, we're in conceptual section number one, simulating the t-test. We're going to uh, use R to look at some of the underlying distributions associated with a t-test. We're going to start off by simulating the results of a single experiment. So for example, um, we're going to have an experiment that has 10 subjects per group. And I've created an n variable. If we wanted to change this later on, we could just change the 10 to a different number. We're going to have a simple experiment. There's two groups. There's going to be subjects in group A and group B. They'll be randomly assigned. We're also going to begin simulating the null distribution. So we're going to assume that this pretend experiment didn't work. That is, the only differences between the subjects in group A and B can be due to random sampling. We'll assume that the scores that subjects in A and B receive are being pulled from the exact same distribution. I'm also going to assume that for each subject in this experiment, we're going to take two measurements per subject. And this could be, I mean, an exp we'll just set this as a value. And so that means for every subject, we're gonna get two values and take the mean of that, uh, those two values for their overall mean in the experiment. We will set some distribution assumptions here and we'll make sure that the uh, mean for group A and B are the same and the standard deviation for group A and B are the same. And for simplicity, we'll assume that the scores are being sampled from a normal distribution with mean 100 and standard deviation 25. All right, let's look at this in R. Uh, I need to run all these things, and now we've got all of that stuff set up. And I think that should be good, but actually I'll, I'll just clear the workspace to get started again. Here we go. Now that we have those assumptions in place, we can simulate the results of a single experiment. For example, let's simulate the scores for, for our A subjects. So I'm using the R norm function and I'm saying that I want N times X. So N is 10, X is two. I want 20 total scores sampled from a normal distribution with a mean 100 and a standard deviation of 25. And I'll do the same thing for the B scores. Now we've made a data frame here that puts these scores alongside with some independent variable factors. Let's take a look. Okay, so this data frame contains example data for subject one. Remember, each subject has two scores in this experiment. So subject one in group A had two scores, subject two had two scores, subject three had two scores, and so on, and so on for group B as well. And <clears throat> I should point out that Subject one in group A is intended to be a different subject than group B. I could have clarified that over here, I suppose, by using different subject numbers. However, it's not particularly important at this moment. So now that we have our simulated data, which is a possible outcome from this experiment, let's load dplyr, and we're going to summarize this data into a new data frame containing the subject means in each of the conditions. So uh, that, in other words, in our simulated data, each subject, whoops, not there, let me, here's the right one. In our simulated data, as I mentioned, each subject contributes two scores. If we want to get a mean for each subject, we'd have to get the average for each subject in each group. And that's our goal here. We are submitting the sim data data frame to a processing pipe. First, we group by the groups column here representing A's and B's. Then we group by the subjects column. 
which has the values 1 to 10. And when we do that, we're going to uh, calculate the mean of the scores column right here for each of the individual pairs of groups and subjects. And I've added dot groups equals drop to get rid of the annoying message that happens with the summarize command. So let's take a look at what we have here. We now have a data frame with 20 rows. We've reduced the number of rows because rather than having two scores per subject, we now have one mean per subject and we have 20 total subjects, 10 in each group. So these 10 values could be put into the t-test function along with these 10 values. Or we could use the um, formula notation. Means is the dependent variable and groups is the independent variable. So I did that here. Means as a function of groups, var dot equal equals true, so that we don't do the Welch's correction. And the data here is in the subject means data frame. So there we have conducted a independent sample t-test on some fake data that we generated. And I could have done this a little bit more quickly in terms of a one-liner. For example, we could do it this way. Um, this is inside the t-test function. These are going to be the means for group A, and these are going to be the means for group B. And what I'm doing is, first of all, using the rnorm function to sample x, which is set at 2, values from a normal distribution with a mean set at 100 and a standard deviation set at 25. So this will, this will sample two values for one subject. This will calculate the mean of one subject. And the replicate function is used to repeat this as for as many subjects as we want. So here we have 10 subjects. So this one line, every time I run it, will generate 10 means for 10 subjects who contributed two scores each. This one will do the very same thing. So we could, uh, representing the means from group B, and we could just put all of this in a t-test and run the t-test. And here we are seeing the results of another simulated experiment. Every time I press the play button then, it's like we're running a different version of this experiment. Let's do it. If we notice, the degrees of freedom will always be 18. That's appropriate to this design. But the t-value keeps changing as the um, data for each subject in each group is randomly different because of the random sampling. So remember, the means for both should be about 100. And uh, if you look at the mean for x, which is the mean of group A here, and the mean of y, they're not always going to be 100. The differences will be due to chance. In this case, we got a difference that's about 10 and a negative t value, 1.5. The probability of this difference by chance is 0.14. Let's just do this a couple times. Oh, this one is probability 0.06. So this difference is um, 109.95, so almost uh, 16. The t value is getting a little bit bigger. A difference of this size uh, only occurs 0.06 of the time. I'll persist in doing this. Let's just see if we can find a, quote, significant experiment. Remember, this is the null hypothesis that we're simulating. So there shouldn't be any different. There, there are no actual differences between group A and B because we're sampling the numbers from the same distribution. Oh, oh I just missed it. I have to go back in time. 
okay, I'll stop doing this, but every, you know, every once in a while, you'll get a difference by chance that is rare. Uh, and, and those uh, differences could be mistaken as type one errors. All right, we've got a sense for the next thing that we want to do, which is to start looking at uh, simulations of uh, simulating distributions of whole experiments. I'd like to reference the very first sentence in student's paper, and it's quite a nice sentence. So he says, any experiment may be regarded as forming an individual of a population of experiments, which might be performed under the same conditions. A series of experiments is a sample drawn from this population. I like that. That is what we've been doing. We've been considering one experiment and we've set up a simulation where we can repeatedly run this very same experiment and see what could have happened. Every time uh, we can calculate a T value from a set of sample data that could have happened. So we don't only get the one T value and that we would normally get in the real world, but in our simulations, we can get as many sample T values as we want. We've been playing this game in the labs across all of the labs, we've been doing this with respect to sampling distributions. So for example, uh, before we go on and make a sampling distribution of the T statistic, let's take our experiment that we've been running right now and do something that's fairly familiar to us. For example, if this very same experiment was repeated 1000 times, then each time there could be a mean difference between group A and B. And of course, we could measure this group difference. Um, I have that here. Let's see if we can highlight it to make it more clear. What this will do is sample two scores for each subject, get the mean, and do that n number of times, and then get the total mean. So this is effectively going to get the mean for group A, and group A has 10 subjects who each have two scores from a normal distribution with mean 100 and standard deviation uh, 25. And we're going to subtract an uh, almost duplicate of this. This is referring to the mean of group B, which will also have 10 subjects, two scores each, mean 100, uh, standard deviation 25. We're going to do this 1,000 times. So here, what we're going to do, and this would be for, if we just go back up here, remember this is an example of doing one example experiment. Here we got a mean for group A and a mean for group B. Now if we took the difference there, we'd see that it's about roughly three. And every time we press play, we're gonna get a different difference. So there's a difference of about two. And here's a difference of about four. So we've just done that 1,000 times and we're looking at a histogram of mean differences. This shows us that on average, we're going to get a difference of zero, which is what we expect when there are no differences between the samples. However, in this situation, you know, we can easily get differences following this distribution as great as 20, for example, by chance. With the T distribution, we're just doing one more thing. I'll just go over to the website here so that we can see the uh, formula. Just as a reminder, here's the T formula. What we were just looking at is just the top part of the T formula. We, for each experiment, calculated the mean of group one and the mean of group two, and we subtracted them. And then we did that a thousand times and we got this distribution. In the case of T, instead, or in addition to calculating the difference between each group, we're normalizing it by an appropriate measure of the standard error of this distribution. So we estimate that standard error in the independent samples t-test case using a pooled error term defined here. Now I'm not going to focus too much on these formulas. Let's go back to our lab, uh, what we're going to do is rather than calculating the mean difference 1,000 times, we're gonna use the t-test function 
and save the t statistic that is computed each time. So we're going to run the experiment 1,000 times, and rather than create a sampling distribution of the mean difference, we will just calculate the t statistic for each of the 1,000 experiments. And I'm putting that in a variable called sim underscore t's. And here's what that looks like. And so this is a t distribution. It's showing us the kinds of t's that we could have got. On average, we expect our t to be zero because the numerator of the t formula is a difference between two means that we expect to be zero. We can see that the value of t ranges here. And if we were to conduct an experiment with these many subjects, so that is 10 in each group, um, we would have, uh, we could get our t value and uh, compare it to a t distribution like this one, which has a degrees of freedom of 18. Now this is a simulated t distribution. We can also use the t distribution functions to uh, look at t distributions more closely. For example, we could use the rt function to sample random t values from a distribution with degrees of freedom 18. So I did that a thousand times, and these two uh, histograms look pretty similar because they're both referencing the same underlying concept. We could use the dt function to draw the probability density function for t distributions across a range of degrees of freedom. So uh, here we go. These are t distributions. They look normal. They're a little bit shorter and more spread out than a normal distribution. And as, oh, that's supposed to be df, not k. Uh, but as the degrees of freedom, let me just change that here, df, df, df. As the degrees of freedom increase, uh, we know from the lecture that the t distribution converges on a normal distribution. We can see that kind of quickly. If we use the qNorm function, remember this is for a normal distribution, what I've set is a, I've asked the question, what is the quantile where 95% of all values are smaller than this value? I'm using a unit normal distribution we get 1.644. If you remember, that's the critical value for a z-test. Well, we could use the qt function and ask 0.95. Um, so when we have a degrees of freedom for two, so this is now we're talking about the t distribution. What is the t value when degrees of freedom is two? Well, it's 2.9. What is the t value when degrees of freedom is one? See, the one here is pretty spread out. So 95% uh, of all values here are kind of, you have to draw the line kind of way out here because it's so spread out. My point is, as you keep increasing the degrees of freedom, so let's go up to five, you'll see that the T value, the critical T value, um, keeps getting smaller And actually, it approaches 1.644. So I've got that all in one go. Uh, this is 1.644 from the normal distribution. And as we increase degrees of freedom, so 1, 5, 10, 100, 1,000, that uh, t value approaches 1.644. So this is a way to just quickly talk about um, the fact that the t distribution converges on a normal.